You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Pioneer has a new inverter of truth and its name is Archfiend of the Dross. We've got eight new deck lists to unlock the power of the Demon Splinter Twin. Then on the flashback, a 5-0 trophy with Invasion of Gobicon. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, and I am joined by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is Daniel Schrieber. Dan, what is going on? I'm hanging in there, David, trying to survive the heat. We have a blistering heat dome that has settled over the land, and I'm bunkered up inside. <laughs> Air conditioning is a, the great invention of the 20th century. <laughs> And you really hear it working down here. Like <laughs> some parts of the country, you know, central air, it's quiet. It's just a quiet presence. But here it's chugging away and it's a, like, the pathos, you can feel it. It's like, it's <laughs> a tension. I don't know if it's going to make it through the rest of this month. <laughs> yeah. What are they talking about? It's like a wet bulb or whatever. Something <laughs> the like wet that, bulb phenomenon. <laughs> How are things with you? Good. Got back from uh, Iceland, about to head up north for 4th of July, which should be excellent. The best part of summer is here. I'm jealous. <laughs> it's cabin time in Minnesota, that's for sure. All right, we have a big show today. We are going to be talking about our newest brews, and they are related to Archfiend of the Dross. This is a card I really liked when it came out. I've been toying around with a little bit of it and some new technology uh, from CFT SOC uh, kind of blew up this card at the Pro Tour qualifiers, like a bunch of the regional qualifiers. I don't know when he like unveiled his technology. Yeah, it was at DreamHack Dallas Regional Championship, which I guess is kind of like a, a mini nationals. Yeah. If we can use that analogy. Yeah, and then we also have some results from our Invasion of Gobicon list. Uh, but before we get into all that, we need to do a little housekeeping at the top. We want to just remind people if they enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, the best way to do that is to go to... Uh, Patreon.com slash Faithless Brewing. Join at whatever level you are comfortable with. You get to support the show. You get Discord access. You get other fun perks. You get to vote for cards for the new monthly project. Uh, yeah, you get to swap ideas with a bunch of people, probably a lot of them involving the One Ring in Modern. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you also get other perks, like you can send in your decks for us to review. Uh, in our last episode, over the weekend, you heard David and I going over a whole bunch of listener-submitted decks in the Brew Review. We like to do that uh, from time to time as well, just see what everyone is working on. So that is a perk you will get for joining the Faithless family as well. Absolutely. And one of the places, one of the cards that people are discussing on the Discord is the Archfiend of the Dross itself. So, you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about is also informed by a lot of really smart people who have tried a bunch of different ideas uh, with this card already. Yeah, exactly. We got a whole little cadre of people working hard on Archfiend ever since uh, DreamHack Dallas, basically. The card's got an interesting history. So, as David mentioned, it really had its, its breakout onto the Pioneer scene at that tournament from a Magic Online player who goes by the name CFTSOC. What's so funny about it is that when you dug into this person's history, it turns out that back in March or April, they had sent out a, a mysterious tweet on their Twitter saying, I think I just broke Pioneer. I got this amazing combo and it's bugged. It doesn't even work. I can't even use it. <laughs> But what's extra funny is that they went on to say, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is because I think it's actually still pretty good and I might, I might play it someday. And sure enough, they ended up 
iterating on this secretly in the secret lab and unveiled it, uh, much to everyone's delight, at DreamHack Dallas, where they did make day two. Um, I don't think they ended up advancing to the Pro Tour, but they had a, a respectable showing. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Like, super sweet tech. I think famously even um, Aspiring Spike like tweeted out, like, I got crushed by this combo. I didn't know it was a thing. And then he like had the two pictures. And to just not get paid off for that, right? Like, it kind of gets lost in the sands of time. Like, who comes up with these decks? You, you know, it'd be like if somebody came up with, like, Call Blade and then, but somehow nobody top eight it from Channel Fireball. And, like, well, then it still went on to dominate and lead to all these bans. So, uh, awesome, awesome job. Like, I, I, this was not even close to being on my radar. I had actually been tooling around with Archfiend of the Draw decks, which is funny. And, I, like, this card is just a... Uh, you know, it's a Splinter Twin S card. It's it's way more limited in a bunch of different ways. Like it certainly hasn't broken Pioneer, even with people not even knowing the technology. Um, you know, he wasn't even even able to top eight his event, although he had a successful event. So I think it's just a super cool, you know, interaction. You know, immediately the sort of content merchants of Pioneer started just like jamming a bunch of different versions, and we haven't really seen it do that well, actually. Um but it, it is certainly something you have to be mindful of, and, and it's just a you know it's just a great find by CTFT SOC. So shout outs to him. Exactly, we have no idea how to pronounce that name, but we witness you. Yes, Faith is Brewing remembers. Yes, we we know. <laughs> yeah, so I did. A, uh, I asked the people in our Discord because I know they've been posting list after list, working on it, and I said, "Do you guys feel like there's actually more to explore?" And the answer was a resounding yes. Um, so we got a bunch of deck lists from the discord, David, you got some new sketches that you want to propose. And we'll talk a little bit about what people have been succeeding with. Exactly. Like David's saying, it's actually, it's not doing that well in the pioneer queues. You only see Archfiend decks every once in a while. And I'm curious to know why that is. So we'll dig into all of that in today's show. That being said, maybe we should read the card. Yeah. So two black, black for a six, six flying, and they have printed a series of cards with this exact stat line. Uh, a black rare with uh, two black black 6-6 six, six flying and then some kind of drawback. Um, there was a 6-6 six, six that said you can't win the game, your opponents can't lose the game. Uh, the Conley Woods played in this super awesome ninja list in Old Extended. That's one of my favorite decks of all time. Uh, there was another one that was quite good in Mono Black Devotion. I think during the beginning of your combat, your opponent can sacrifice a creature and tap it and put a plus one plus one counter on it. Uh, there's a new vampire, I think, that's a four mana, five, six flying. And whenever your opponent casts a spell, they get a blood. And when it attacks for every blood in play, it gets like plus one, plus O oh or something. Something like that. Yeah. Am I misremembering? It, it's, it's a four mana of Mahamori Jin. And then <laughs> your opponent gets a blood every time they cast a spell. Yeah. And it has a trample and it gets bigger based on how much blood they have. Yeah. Yeah. So... If you're playing along at home, Abyssal Persecutor, that's the first card. Yeah. Um, Desecration Demon is the one where you sacrifice creatures to tap it. All right, but what's the vampire? You don't know that one off the top of your head. Gosh. Blood Tithe. No, not Blood Tithe. Dang, you got me. Falcon Wrath something. I think it is Falcon Wrath. <sighs> I thought that card would be kind of sweet with Waste Knot. Uh, I played against it one time and I was like, wow, this is actually really good. Like, they gave me all this blood. I had to sacrifice it to keep it from killing me. And then, like, Waste Knot triggered a bunch of times. <laughs> Something to think about. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, this is the latest iteration. So it's a, it's a space saving sports, I guess the point. Now this is four mana flying. It enters a battlefield with four oil counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, remove an oil counter from Archfiend of the Dross. Then if it has no oil counters on it, you lose the game. So the turn that you remove the last one, it uh, causes you to lose the game. And so, okay, it has a weakness. That's a, that's a pretty major one. But it has an additional plus. It does not have trample, but it says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, its controller loses two life. So it does not have trample, but does punish them for chump blocking. And if you have other ways to kill creatures, right, it can be quite a speedy clock. You kill their blocker and attack, you get to do eight damage that turn, for instance. That's such an intriguing clause, right? It's like the Masker Worm text, or like having two Blood Artists in play. A lot of damage from that. Yeah, so like David's saying, it's it's like a countdown. You start with four oil, but as soon as that countdown hits zero, uh, you're toast. So you really only get three attacks despite having four counters. One question that may come up is, what happens if the Archfiend is about to run out of counters and I try to remove it in response? Does that succeed? 
this could happen, for example, on your last upkeep, right? You, you untap, Archfiend is about to tick down from one to zero. If you sacrifice it at that point, or get rid of it somehow, Archfiend will go away, the trigger will still resolve, and the game will use the last known number of oil counters on the Archfiend of the draw. So the game will remember that you had one counter there, but because you actually can no longer remove that counter, you will survive that trigger, if I'm reading this ruling correctly. Yep. On the other hand, the reason this card is being talked about is it has this very specific combo with the card Metamorphic Alteration. So David, maybe we should talk about this one here too. Yeah, so kind of a forgotten rare from M19. So it is one in a blue enchant creature. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature. Uh, enchanted creature is a copy of the chosen creature. So you cast it, you target a creature. When it resolves, that creature becomes a copy of another creature. Um, and this interaction is very interesting with the demon because you make it a copy of the demon, but creatures do not come, no other creature has oil counters on it. So it has no oil counters. It now becomes an Archfiend of the Dross with no oil counters. And Dan's trick, like he was describing, where you get to back to your upkeep, this trigger goes on the stack, and even if you kill it in response, you have your Doomblade effect or whatever. Um, it remembers the last known information exactly like we were describing before, only this time it started with zero. So it finds that you do, in fact, lose the game. So this, uh, if you're not expecting it, if you just play turn four Archfiend, they tap out, and you play this two-mana enchantment on in a creature, unless it has the ability to sack itself, uh, there is no way for them to win. So I'm sure the first couple times uh, CFTSOC was doing this, it was just like, what? <laughs> like, I played my Fable on turn three or whatever, and then played my Shieldred, I'm so far ahead, and now the game is over. <laughs> Right, and that includes if they somehow get rid of the metamorphic alteration, right? That doesn't help either. Even though the creature will at that point no longer be an Archfiend of the Dross, as long as that trigger has gone on the stack, you're still going to lose. Because you, you'll still have zero oil. So really, if you can't stop this by the time it goes to your turn, that's it. You're done. So you have to stop it on, on their turn if we're imagining that the, you know, they, well, they play these at sorcery speed. Gotta do it on their end step if you want to get out of this. Otherwise, you're toast. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a few, you know, corner cases where you, you know, end the turn or something, right? The the, the blue-white. Mm, true. <laughs> uh, the blue card that ends the turn. I mean, but it's stuff like that, right? There's there's no normal cards. No uh, removal spell, no interactive spell, other than something that specifically stops a trigger. There's a handful of cards that do that. Um, so. So what we're looking at here is a two-card combo that wins the game. An A plus B combo splinter twin combo these are what these are usually called and specifically in pioneer because we're talking about a four mana six six black creature that pairs with a two mana blue card i mean that's the exact second coming of inverter of truth so this is the, the new inverter that's a theory at least but the question becomes like is this actually good and if so why or why not when you dig into the history of archfiend and pioneer you find that the first decks that picked it up were actually not common at all. It was just picked up by rogues, blue-black rogues, and a couple R Rakdos mid-range players who thought, like, it was actually an interesting techie option. It's just like a big, beefy creature that dominates the battlefield. Only takes a couple attack stacks to kill the opponent. That lose two life per creature trigger could come up a lot. So the Archfiend by itself is somewhere between pretty good to quite strong, and I think that's something that we definitely want to learn more about. On the other hand, what about the alteration? Nobody, nobody plays this card. It's barely even a card. So the question becomes like, are, are we playing four of each? Or, and just assuming that every time we draw the alteration, we're, we're just going to hang on to it and wait for the combo to get assembled? Or are we going to try to dig into the alteration as well and figure out how to make this a little bit of a stronger contributor to you know, whatever plan B is? Yeah, I mean, that that second option is very difficult, right? We don't play enchantments just to... Co I mean, we, we don't even play clones, right? That that card is basically done. To play a card that we have to enchant another creature with that then can clone is is a very, very weak card. There's a reason, basically, people didn't know what that this card existed um, before we were shown the light. <laughs> so, yeah, I and I actually think that's the reason why this hasn't been that successful. I mean, even in the tournament where nobody knew what he was doing, you know, and he probably had a bunch of free wins where people tapped out 
like they I play Archfiend, okay, I play Fable, pass, you know, tap land, pass. And you then people lose those games. That's before people knew how to play against this, knew the combo even existed, and he still did not top eight. It's just a sign that like these cards, because they are I mean, I, I think Archfiend is is pretty powerful, but the alteration being weak, the combo requiring them to have a creature in play, like there's real controls here that um I think have like luckily been a bit of a guide rail from this taking over uh, the format. So given your assessment of the relative strengths of Archfiend and Metamorphic Alteration, what will be the closest historical parallel in A plus B combos? Oh, man. Like uh, Heliod, maybe? Heliod Ballista? Yeah. Which should be legal in Pioneer, <laughs> but you know, whatever, we don't have to get, go into all that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I want to say Inverter of Truth passes Oracle, but... Well, it only had a 47% win rate. That's, people, that's... Forget, people forget about that. <laughs> and I think Archfiend Alteration is worse. So <laughs> yeah, so... Maybe this is the second coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's what we're dealing with here today. So looking at Archfiend, probably yes. going to explore it in conjunction with Metamorphic Alteration. But we have to leave open the possibility that Alteration is actually holding holding the Archfiend back. So David, I see you've got some ideas here that actually don't involve the alteration at all, right? Just using Archfiend of the Dross as its own, it's its own man, his own demon. Right? Let, let him go his own way. And maybe that's the key to finding success. Maybe. I mean, I think people have done a really good job and this is going to be one of those things where everyone, of course, knows the the fundamental combo, right? But the people, especially like in our Discord, Discord um, DJF MTG has a, a super sweet list here. These people who understand like how to play with these decks begin to separate themselves, right? This isn't like um, Splinter Twin, where basically everyone kind of played it the same way, and it's only the people that kind of took it to the next level and added like the third color and played Tarmo Twin and all that stuff. Um, this is a deck that really rewards like a lot of decision trees, right? Like when you dig on turn four, what pieces you even take? Like, are you going to win the game with just draw speed down? Should you? Should you take a uh, alteration in the dark with no dross in your hand? There's just so many decisions to make. So I think that the people that keep exploring this, you know, there is this out. And as we have like more and more generic, powerful pieces that might go along with it or searching pieces, uh, the deck could, could uh, keep improving. All right, David. So with all that in mind, where should we start? So yeah, I had actually already been tinkering around with Archfiend just in a fight rigging deck before I was aware of them, uh, Metamorphic Alteration combo. Uh, just as a, another card that flips, I don't think that Shakedown Heavy and Rotting Registrar are super powerful cards. I always hated having to play with them. Or even when I was playing with them, you know, you wanted more. You wanted a better card to go. And the Archfiend plus Fight Rigging changes your math, so you typically only need like two attacks to kill your opponent instead of the third. So yeah, the, my instinct was that the Fight Rigging is nice because you can actually find the alteration on turn two, play Archfiend, and then it puts the alteration into play for free. And they don't have, I mean, they obviously can respond to the trigger of fight rigging, but they don't know that you have alteration. So it actually like creates a weird incentive. Like they don't know how desperate their need to kill the Archfiend is. Um, so yeah, just, just a pretty standard deck, right? The, the I've explored with fight rigging quite a bit. Um, we have, 20 lands, four uh, turn timber symbiosis, eight elves, the four fight rigging. Reg Rotting Registrar is okay. Shakedown Heavy is terrible, but we're playing all eight. Uh, four Archfiend, two Valky. The only blue card is uh, Metamorphic Alteration. And then uh, just some Black Disruption. And I did notice that somebody 5 0 with a fight rigging list. So, like, there's at least proof of concept here. Although their deck has a bunch of weird choices in it uh, that surprised me. Yeah, I'm looking at a 5-0 here from Biz1 from June 19th. So what are the differences? David's list has got the classic core of Elf into 3-drop, right? Fight Rigging is a 3-drop. It's 2 and a green enchantment. Hideaway 5. Beginning of your combat step, put a counter on something. Plus 1, plus 1 counter. Then if you have a creature with power 7 or greater, you get to unlock the, the Hidden Away card. So in order to make this happen, reload up on the six power creatures, the seven power creatures. But 
what we found in our previous explorations of fight rigging is that, you know, <laughs> those creatures are not very good. So maybe you just want to go a little bit smaller, right? I, what was the one? The werewolf? I think you like the werewolf, the pack leader. Is that right? I do not remember liking the pack leader in this list at all. <laughs> okay, maybe not the pack leader, but I think you like the love struck beast. Um, love struck beast, of course, is a 5-5, five five, so it does take two turns of being rigged up with the fight rigging, but it's, it's more of like, uh, you know, it's solid whatever you draw it. So the list from Biz1 uh, is playing for Lovestruck Beast, is playing, uh, it looks like a Glissa Sunslayer. And some weird stuff, I, I see one Stone Coil Serpent, that can't be right, although it's kind of cute that, that that is one way to turn your own Metamorphic Alteration into a Terminate, because if you have the Stone Coil Serpent in play, you can turn one of their creatures into a copy of Stone Coil Serpent, and just like it won't have oil counters from the Archfiend, it also won't have any plus one, plus one counters from the Stone Coil. But it's, like, not a card. Yeah, I mean, all that stuff is way too cute. A 1 of Glissa, a 2 of Ranger class, uh, a 1 of Ren and Realm Breaker, like... So that I actually do like, and I, I do want to ask you about that, because one of the tricky things, as soon as you move away from a Demure core, right, like you're basically built a black-green deck just splashing or alteration, but what, once you're in those colors, we don't have any way to dig for our pieces in those colors. Except for the fact that both Archfiend and Alteration are permanents. So now we have some green cards. Uh, Battle of Ixalan, Invasion of Ixalan, is that the one? Uh, and Ren and Realm Breaker that allow you to dig for any permanent. So if you want to, if you want to like actually find these pieces even more often, you could go like, okay, Elf into Ren and Realm Breaker, that's my plan. Uh, or turn to an Invasion of Ixalan, that's my plan. So that I'll actually pretty quickly find the Alteration and the Archfiend. Does that appeal to you at all? No, I actually like playing this deck as like an aggro deck. There's a combo finish in it as opposed to this other deck, which is much more of just if I don't combo, I can't win. Um, I, I think that fight rigging is very powerful. I've liked this card quite a bit just as a generic value engine. The plus one, plus one counters every turn. I think just generically a six mana flying creature that gets pushed to seven power and, you know, functionally draws a card and makes a little bit of mana, even if it's not the combo. Um... And if the card I was finding with my fight rigging was Ren and Realm Breaker or Ranger class, that that's a huge, huge blow to my chance of winning an aggro game. <laughs> like I've tooled around with Ranger class. I've tooled around with builds with Archfiend of Dross with the uh, two, three that adds an extra token. So it actually comes into play with five oil counters. If you have the black green snake and that mm -hmm. also works very well with fight rigging. And if you're building that kind of shell, you can play Ranger class. But again, now you're building more of a mid-range deck. That's not a combo deck. So this deck is more in on, I think, the combo aspects of it. Um, yeah. And, you know, maybe maybe that's the way to go. I, again, it's so hard to say, like, the mana gets really screwy. How much blue mana do you really need? You know, you don't need blue mana until, like, turn five. <laughs> uh, you're hoping to free cast your alteration. I mean, I think the... The thing that's most interesting to me about the fight rigging thing is you're really just trying to put fight or uh, put the alteration under fight rigging. I mean, that that's my main goal. This is probably a terrible idea, but would you be at all interested in a card like the five mana eight eight clack bridge troll that spits out some goat tokens on the opponent's side? <laughs> you never attack with it, but it does trigger fight rigging by itself, and with Archfiend. Every time they second goat, they're going to get punished. Um, I think that's probably just a little too clunky. Even if you do that in turn four, again, you're you're losing your ability to ever win the normal game. <laughs> they get punished. They lose two life. Is that what you mean? <laughs> well, I mean, you also you also draw a card and you gain life. Right, but your life doesn't matter, right? Because either the the draws kills them or it kills you. So your life total probably isn't the actually limiting factor in most games. So the life game basically isn't a thing. Also, if you're playing fight rigging, I think you really want to like flip it, right? Three mana to start putting plus one, plus one counters on things is not particularly good. So you're hoping like turn one elf, turn two fight rigging. Mm -hmm. If they kill the elf, you I, I like the idea of having a three drop you can play to turn on fight rigging. If they don't kill the elf, obviously you're hoping to play Archfiend. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm approaching it from. Yeah, I mean it's even better if you go elf into Shakedown Heavy or Riding Regisaur. 
Oh, it hurts to say those sentences, but like that's that's <laughs> the curve, right? And you want to play fight rigging when you're immediately going to get the hideaway. I will say, like, the Shakedown Heavy's negative ability I really hate, but drawing a card is way better in a deck with an A plus B combo than it would be in just a beat down deck. So that's why I'm back to playing the full four. Um, because I was liking the idea of the prototype black card, which is actually like a sweet card to cheat in with fight rigging. You can get the mm. full seven five. It's an awesome body to put the plus one plus one counters on. But once you're going again to have this A plus B combo, then the actual drawback of the shakedown heavy is actually not bad because every card you draw is a card closer to putting the A plus B combo together. All right, so that'll be a black green shell with a light splash for alteration. The next shell is one that I think you've already tested this a little bit. It's looking at mainly a Rakdos core, black red with the Archfiend. And I think when you initially conceived of this deck, it had Demonic Pact in it. So this this was maybe part of why we didn't we didn't see the alteration at first is because when you see a card that says you lose the game, right? Well, where's the first place your mind goes? It's, well, I would, I would love for my opponent to lose the game. So why don't I offer this card to you with Harmless Offering? So now it's it's almost like Rule of Eight, Archfiend of the Draws, Demonic Pact, and you can play Harmless Offering with that. And I think what we failed to realize is that actually because Archfiend is on a different creature type, we have this, this backdoor way of giving them a copy of the Archfiend through the blue enchantment. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that Alteration was a card, so <laughs> I didn't see it because it was totally off my radar. I, no, nobody saw it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not recommending this list per se, but this is a list I'd already played, I think, to a couple of three twos, like in the Pioneer world before the Alteration deck exists. Basically, the thought is you have Archfiend of Dross, and then your deck is like basically the standard red, green, you know, or excuse me, red, black. So you've got Push Slotsies, Blood Tithe Harvester, Fable, Bone Crusher. Fair enough. The Green Splash, it was literally just to. Um, accelerate maybe that's not needed but i was thinking i wanted to uh sylvan carry added to play archfiend at the time i was also like you're saying in the original build i think i had three demonic packs so the speed of sylvan carry added was attractive uh glissa seemed also interesting and then harmless offering and then we were main decking for heartless axe so you could actually just give them the archfiend very early the theory was turn three archfiend turn four harmless offering heartless act uh, with five mana wins the game because the act removes the three counters. Um, it's such a fascinating card, right? It's one on a black instant. You either destroy a creature with no counters on it or you remove three counters from a creature. And it's become so much more interesting now that the bug is fixed and people actually play Archfiend of the Draws because if you just happen to draw a Heartless Act and they play their own Archfiend hoping to combo you, you just kill them instead. <laughs> you Heartless Act their Archfiend, <laughs> remove three counters from it, and then they die on their upkeep. Um, so I think in that sense, this list has actually gotten better than when you initially conceived of it. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the, the main realization was that the green mana is a major cost and I don't think I would play it Um and, and the re other reality is that the Fable Archfiend, which is the like backup plan, was actually just like an awesome plan. Uh, that's why I think a few just normal red-black mid-range people had just picked up the shell. Um, because copying the Archfiend and attacking for 12, and then every creature that happens to die that turn, they lose four, is just a crazy clock right out of nowhere. So I think you can just rebuild this list, just replace the Caryatids and the Glissas, just play straight red black. The top of your curve can be Archfiend instead of Shieldred. And um, you're probably just in an okay place. It, does, it won't feel like much of a brew because it's basically the same deck instead of the random two mana interaction that red black plays where you're just locked in on Heartless Act. Uh, you have a lot of looting effects to get rid of um, your Harmless Offerings if you don't want them between your Blood and your Fable. And then in theory, they help you find them at the end. So Fable, the thing about... Um, the, the harmless offering plan is one, you're playing red, so you get to do the fable archfiend thing. So your backup plan is way better than blue black. Your combo is much weaker, right? You have to get the archfiend all the way down to one before you donate it. There's they have space in their upkeep still to kill it, etc. etc. But your combo can work even if they have no creatures. But one of the problems with the blue black combo is it requires them to have a creature in play. Um so, you know, this is a much better deck against control, for instance, because you can still win by your combo. I, I think this is going to be a worse deck in general, but I think just being able to play red-black and 
make your mana awesome. And we know that the red black shell is at times a allegedly bannable um, shell is is worth considering as well. Definitely agree on cutting the green. Like this version without demonic pact doesn't need to accelerate. So we'll go down to Rectos. The change that I might want to explore. I don't like how we still have this harmless offering that really doesn't do anything. So what if instead of Vet as my card that I want to draw with Archfiend, what if I replace that with Vildur and Thrillseeker? Same mana cost. You know, it's a 1-1 one, one with, I want to say Bushido, but it's not Bushido. Back up, back up. Thank you. Back up too, and then you can sacrifice itself and the creature that it backed up to fling them. So it's almost like a... It's almost lethal, right? If you have Archfiend in play, 6-6 six, six flying, your turn, you play Vildur and Thrillseeker, put two counters on Archfiend, you're attacking for 8 now. I assume they don't have a flyer. So that's 8 damage right there, you can fling it for another 8, that's 16. That That's mostly lethal. And the Thrillseeker is like a decent card on its own. So that, that could replace the Harmless Offerings. You have to let change some things up to make the Thrillseeker a little more attractive. Like probably I would replace you know, the, the Sylvan Curatids and maybe even the Heartless Axe with cheaper little creatures. Like we saw a, we saw a deck that had like Dreadhorde Butcher at one point with Thrillseeker. Do you mm -hmm. remember this? Um, I like the three, two that um, you can play out of your graveyard for four mana uh, with haste mm. and then you take two damage when it dies, but you get to draw a card. Yeah. Tenacious underdog. underdog. Yeah. Does that appeal to you at all? Like this, yeah, no, I, I think I think it's very reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, I do think the harmless offering plan is awesome. Now that everyone's playing red removal, mm. they really struggle to beat the uh, the draw. So, in theory, the harmless offerings are bad against decks that play black removal. But if you play like blue red, if you play mono green decks that can't interact, then you you're gonna be very happy that you have the uh, harmless offering plan. So it's it's more of a meta call, I think. But I, I think what you're describing is like just a very reasonable plan. All right, so that is a black green, splash blue, black red, maybe splash green, but probably just go straight black red. We haven't talked about the proper inverter deck yet. And here we have a much richer history to draw on. So what about pure Demir combo? This is the area that a lot of people have been exploring, and somewhat surprisingly, there, there has not been a consensus list that has emerged yet. So let's see what that would look like, and I'm going to refer here to a list from friend of the show, D. Jeff MTG, or Dylan, who has been working on this together with half a dozen other brewers in our Discord. He's been racking up tons of results. I don't know if he's made a 5-0 with it quite yet, although I know Law 11 has their own version that they 5 0 with, so we'll talk about that as well. But Dylan actually submitted this version for our brew review episode, and it was very much on theme, so we're going to talk about it here. Demir Archfiend combo, and when we're talking Demir Archfiend combo, we're thinking, all right, spiritual to successor to inverter. That means I want dig through time, right? I want to find my pieces. So I know I'm going to have dig through time. I know I'm going to have Archfiend of the Dross. We're going to go for metamorphic alteration. How, how to surround this to make it a plausible show? Yeah, I mean, I think the one card that's really attracted people to the straight Demir shell is Dig Through Time. And so they wanted to fill their graveyard. Now, it's interesting. He's not playing Consider. He is playing Falaji Archaeologist, a card mm -hmm. that we liked a lot. I don't think we ever actually did a week on. Uh, it's been in a bunch of cool brews that have had little mini moments in Pioneer. And this seems like the perfect place for it, right? There's 24 cards for it to hit. Um, it fills up your graveyard for Dig. It can find Dig. Uh, one of our combo pieces is a card <laughs> that uh, the archaeologist can find. And in a pinch, you could copy your archaeologist, you know, on their creature, and it, it makes it impotent <laughs> as, a, as an attacker. Right. I mean, I was thinking, okay, how can I make metamorphic alteration not suck? And the first card I thought of was Heliod's Pilgrim. It's just so slow, right? That's three mana for a one, two. I tutor up the alteration, and now I have the ability to maybe turn my opponent's creature into a Heliod's Pilgrim. That's five mana. It's just not worth it. But Archaeologist kind of does that a little bit cheaper, right? It becomes this blank creature that you can alter to shrink their Cavalier of Thorns or whatever. It digs for the alteration, but more importantly, it fills a graveyard, so it dig through time you can play with confidence. 
somewhat surprisingly, I think D Jeff really landed on divide by zero, you know, midway through his iterations. And it's it's kind of a surprising inclusion, but he said that he felt like this was a card that gives the necessary interaction and plan B. What do we mean by plan B? Well, divide by zero, as long as you're in blue black and you're just extending the game, eventually divide by zero becomes mascot exhibition. It becomes teachings of the archaics. So it does represent advantage in the deck, even though on its front face, it may feel like it's an inefficient play. So he's playing all four copies here. Then you round that out with the usual suspects for Fatal Push, for Thoughtseize, two Shale Dress Edict, two Drawn of the Lock, and two Chrome Host Seed Shark. Love to see that. Yeah, he even has a note here that Chrome Host Seed Shark actually turns Metamorphic Alteration into a removal spell uh, for sort of the same reason you were describing with the uh, the X Mana creature in the previous in oh, Stone yeah. Quill Serpent. Stone Quill yeah. Serpent, yeah. That's still a lot of mana, um, but I mean, I don't hate the Seed Shark as your actual plan B. I'm, of course, an avowed Divide by Zero hater, so <laughs> I, I don't love it here, but he's he's played the deck and I haven't. So the fact that he settled on that, right, tells you that there's something to it. You do need to have another way to win. Is it going to be, you know, a couple of Shark Typhoons? Is it going to be Chrome Host Seed Shark? Is it going to be four Divide by Zero? There's going to be a lot of games where, A, your combo is disrupted or you don't want to go for your combo and then uh, b your opponent doesn't have creatures right so you have to find a clever way to uh, end the game and divide by zero also resets your archfiend without killing it right so you can mm. put your archfiend back in your hand replay it and so you don't lose the game you get another crack at forcing your opponent to kill it i mean it still is just a six six flyer right it can end the game quite quite quickly so that line alone maybe just justifies it. Just EOT on their end of turn, divide by zero it with one token, uh, one counter left on it, and then you can just replay it and win the old-fashioned way. So if you're listening right now and you're thinking, I would like to try a Demure Archfiend list, this is a good place to start. We'll have a link in the show notes. You may think that it's just, oh yeah, generic Demure, but there's actually a lot of decisions on what not to play. Cards that we didn't mention, right? Consider is not here. Ledger Shredder is not here. Uh, there's no tainted indulgence for example there's plenty of cards you could play that you could talk yourself into them being on theme i think it's just trying to find the right balance of interactive cards cards that don't put you too far behind cards that interact at the right spots on the curve and cards that are on plan right archaeologist is just more on plan than a card like tainted indulgence you know filling up that graveyard becoming a blocker a card i would consider that i don't see people playing is stubborn denial um, I think the card's just awesome with Archfiend. You play Archfiend, their typical play pattern, they know typically, it, whatever, however you want to say it, the Philology Archaeologist, often the fact that you have Metamorphic Alteration is face up. And so you go to play your Alteration, they're going to two for one you by killing your Archfiend, and if you have Summer Denial, you have enough mana to do both of those in the same turn. Or you can play your Archfiend on turn five, Stubborn Denial, their removal spell, um... I'm surprised I don't see it in any of these lists. So that's a card I would at least think about somewhere in your 75. Your plan is to cast a four mana creature with four greater power and then Stubborn Denial just protects it, right? It just seems so good to me. That's a great thought. Yeah, that was like the key level up for these Neoform Attraxa decks. So why wouldn't the same be true for Archfiend combo? I mean, I guess it takes a little bit longer to be able to play Archfiend with protection, but... But I mean, that suggests that you're just going to ever play it. And okay, you don't have Summer Denial on this deck. So what does that mean? You wait till turn six so you can play it. I mean, there's no counter spells here. Right. And like you're playing Drown on the Lock, which is just a terrible card. Um, so I think you've got space to at least consider the card. Maybe maybe he, maybe he it's been tried and, and failed. I've noticed he has two Swan Song in the sideboard. That's a super way of giving your opponent a creature. Super cool way of giving your opponent a creature and interacting. Uh, I've seen people try that in the main deck, so that's super cool tech from uh, DJF MTG. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in picking his brain. If, he, if he's tried Summer Denial, it's just been too weak, too situational. You do only have four creatures with uh, four greater power, unless you turn on your Chrome Host Seed Shark. But, I mean, even, you know, you get you Seed Shark down and dig through time at some point. Summer Denial is just a one-mana negate. It just seems awesome. Yeah, I love that. The card that I thought of when I saw this was Rise to Glory. 
rise to glory. And this is actually the card I think I'm going to pin my hopes on this as the future of Archfiend. I have no proof. I don't even have a list, but I see that you have one, David. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. What is Rise to Glory? It's three white black. I had no idea what this card is, people, by the way. I literally <laughs> was not even like another card that wasn't even on my radar. <laughs> it's like a draft uncommon from one of these sets. So it's three white black sorcery. Choose one or both. You either return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, so five mana reanimate, or you return target or a card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Five mana reanimate and aura. That's, that sounds terrible, but you can get them both in one shot. And why is that attractive? Well, that's exactly what you need to get back both halves of the combo. So what I would love to have happen is, you know, maybe I loot away the metaphor for cultivation because that's a weak card. I just stash it in the graveyard. Maybe I hit it off the Philology Archaeologist and just leave it there because I took it a better card. And then at some point I play my Archfiend. They have to kill it because it's a serious flyer. But now everything's in place, right? They think that they're totally safe. I know that I'm just one Rise to Glory away from an instant kill. So that would be my hope. And you could either splash it into D. Jeff's deck and ruin his beautiful mana base. Or you could say, I want that to be my starting place. I want to build a dedicated Rise to Glory deck. And what would that look like? So I just want to confirm that the timing works. So if you were to bring two clones into play, or a clone and a creature, they wouldn't see each other. But because this goes on a creature that's already in play, it can see the Archfiend to make it a copy of that creature? Yeah, the reason it works is because the, the clone situation most often comes up with Collected Company, and yes. Collected Company says they enter at the same time. Got Rise it. to Glory, they actually, you resolve sequentially. So first mm. you return the creature, then you return the aura. So even though it's all part of the same spell, like technically the creature's already there. Got it. So it does work. Yeah. I like it. So I see you have a list here, David. All about Rise to Glory. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I believe in Rise to Glory, but I was just thinking about the card. So one of the things I really was thinking that would be cool is on turn three, you play Celestis, pass it back. Your opponent foolishly <laughs> plays creatures and spells and everything else. On their end of turn, I tap my Celestis. I cast Otherworldly Gaze. Mm -hmm. I find my fourth land, and I hopefully put my combo in the graveyard. And then, so it sort of ramps to Rise to the Glory. It helps fill my graveyard. And then on the next turn, I cast my Rise to Glory, and I can win. And just as a backup, okay, we didn't assemble A plus B. I just have four Attraxes in the deck as just an attractive card to put in the graveyard. Attraxa finds creature artifact. Mm. enchantment so it can find the combo you know what we've seen with the neoform list is that typically the first attraction doesn't win right it comes into play it finds a stubborn denial or the thought sees that does just enough to, for the second attraxa to or the the delve creatures to win after you're you're up several cards we don't really have the ability to do that you know we're only going to cast so many rise to glories in a given game so Atraxa could find another Rise of Glory, but what it could easily find is the Archfiend Metamorphic Alteration, and Atraxa is a card that must be answered, right? It's a seven uh, power flying life flicker. So they spend their removal on that, and then in theory, we have six mana the next turn. Since we cast Rise of Glory, we could just Archfiend plus Metamorphic Alteration. So we sort of have like a backup in case they take one of our pieces or they don't uh, all end up in our graveyard. Just a Rise of Glory on Atraxa is not an insane play, right? Five mana resurrect, but it's it's a reasonable enough play. Okay, I actually, I really like the top end. I think the change I would make to this sketch is I think you might have like too much air in the lower part of the curve. And it's a little bit counterintuitive because all these cards make sense. Otherworldly gaze, faithful mending, tainted indulgence, consider. I just think that you can't spend that much mana setting it all up. I think you should just pick two. And for me, that would be, maybe is that's gaze and... Maybe we should even consider the archaeologist here as well. And just accept that, you know, when you don't draw gaze, it's not going to happen as fast. But I do think you have to defend yourself a little bit more in the early turns. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I would just like cut the four mendings, go up to two, the two pushes. And then I, I think you still need to play a shit ton of uh, looting mm. effects. Like Neoform doesn't play that much interaction, right? They play between four and six. And eight interactive ah. spells. But they only need like three mana to get the attracts into play, whereas we need to get up to five for Rise to Glory. But they never Neoform on turn three. That that basically never happens. No. <laughs> okay. That's a that's a turn four play for them. We're we have a turn five. Sure. We can also just play Archfiend. That's the other thing. Like our backup plan, like our four mana six six colds, for instance, 
<laughs> every uh, delve creature in Neoform, like they can't attack anymore. This Archie just wins the game. <laughs> Okay, well, I love cutting mending. So if we cut mending and put the fatal pushes in, maybe that's enough. You know, I guess with the tracks that we, we do need to have a little bit more discard than I'm envisioning. But yeah, so I mean, obviously I had not spent a lot of time thinking about Rise of Glory, but this is the kind of deck that I would think about. And like, again, our quote unquote nut draw is some random interactive spell and maybe we've looted. And then on turn three, we play Celestis and make our way to five mana uh, using Dan's favorite card, Otherworldly Gaze, to... Uh, smooth our way to victory <laughs> <laughs> all right so that'll be a little more off the rails on the other hand if you just want a good deck uh we talked about d jeff's list we should also give a shout out to friend of the show la 11 also known as la 11 but we did finally ask them how do we pronounce this it's la 11 <laughs> so <laughs> la 11 who's in the five o's with a yorian version of a demir alteration deck so David, talk me through this one here. Okay, so Urian, you've got your 80 cards. The only creatures are four Archfiend and one Shieldred. Even though there's 80 cards, there are only two Metamorphic Alterations. So I'd be kind of curious to see how many times he won this through like straight value and how many times he actually comboed uh, through the course of his league. Only two dig through times. Um... Other than that, it's just blue-black interaction, right? You, you play Omen of the Sea, which is not a playable card, except for in Urian builds, because you get the extra value. There aren't even that many things for Urian to blink. Uh, there's a one of Life of Toshiro Umazawa. There is three Omen of the Seas. Uh, there are four Invasion of Amonkets. Archfiend is a blinkable card. Uh, it does prevent you from dying to it. Uh, Shieldred does not give you any value if you blink it, other than, I guess, giving it full vigilance that turn. And then you have 31 spells. So it's a really interesting build. Um, Law 11 is like one of the premier Urian builders in uh, Pioneer. Uh, he really knows his way around these shells. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm surprised by a lot of these card choices, but I, I certainly can't, like, suggest that they're wrong. <laughs> he's he's had a lot of success building these. So I know he's a big fan of Invasion of Amonkhet. So that must be part of the appeal. Yeah, definitely. So the front side of Invasion of Amonkhet is an ETB card advantage spell, right? They discard one, you draw one. It's like a disinformation campaign. And if you don't want to fill your deck with surveil stuff to rebuy disinformation campaign, you can just use your companion to reset the invasion and just keep using it as a draw spell. But it's more than that, because it also mills each player for three, and that lets you play John of the Lock with a little more confidence, right? So David, you said the card's bad. There's a big... There's a growing body of evidence, I should say. There's a growing body of evidence that Invasion of Amonkhet plus Drown of the Lock is actually quite good in Pioneer. And here I'm, I'm referring mainly to the work that La Levin and Dylan have done on these archetypes, Lost and Zandi as well. Forcing the opponent to mill three actually can be kind of good when it, it lets you have this really flexible removal spell. So that's part of it, is getting the invasion. The other part of the invasion is, like, hidden in this mana base here, there's four mutavolts. We were talking about this in the Discord, like, why are those Muta Vaults there? Well, it turns out they're there specifically to flip the invasion, and they're actually a very important part of the plan. Two attacks with the Muta Vault is all it takes to flip the invasion. When that happens, you win the battle, you get a 4-4 zombie. It can be a creature from your graveyard, of which you really don't have any, but maybe you have, maybe you killed something with them. Or milled something, or milled something. True. Yeah, or it's just a 4-4. It's a nice body, nice reward for hitting twice with Muta Vault in a control deck. So yeah, I guess I kind of agree, David. I don't really see what the Archfiend combo is doing here. I guess you'd have to win some way, and... It's also interesting to note, like, there are, there are very few creatures in this deck. Invasion can't ever copy Archfiend because it has the exact same problem we just outlined. Oh, it can, actually. Oh, does it get the counters? Uh, yeah, because you cast it from Exile. Oh, okay, okay. And then enters as a copy. So you get a worse Archfiend, but it does give you the option if you have the combo ready, right? You can flip it to an Archfiend if you want. You can pick, but you don't have to copy anything or you can copy something from them if it's better. So the one issue with Invasion is that um, Phoenix has been making a comeback. So I'm wondering if maybe this predates the uh, Phoenix comeback. Like people were on this, people were on Rogues. No one was attacking the mm. graveyard. And then Phoenix all of a sudden just like thundered to the top of a bunch of top eights and challenges and stuff. Uh, and people are just like, yeah, no, people have just been skipping on graveyard hate. 
and all these decks that fill up the graveyard are just it's just tough to play against you know phoenix lists when you're basically just making three mana for them and possibly hitting a phoenix that's true yeah i have been facing phoenix a lot more than i would expect yeah, I guess my problem with the Drown Invasion thing is Drown on the play can't kill an elf. <laughs> on the draw, it can't kill an elf. And it also really struggles to stop Fable on time. So I, you could decide what you think the uh, the principles of the format are, but like those are considerations I'm making when I'm thinking about removal and counter spells. So if you have a, a removal spell that can't kill an elf on the draw or the play most of the time, and you have a counter spell that can't stop Fable... That's like a really tough place to be. So yes, in the turns after you cast Invasion, it is way better than any other two-man removal spell. That is absolutely true. But, you know, Pioneer, when people talk about it being very play draw dependent, that tells me the game is decided very early. And cards that are great on turn four and five, uh, I tend to privilege a little less than cards that might be very bad on four or five, but are very good on turns like two and three. It at least kills the token from Fable. That, that will always do. So it's <laughs> yeah. that's the that buys you some time. The history of interacting with Fable by killing the token is uh, a checkered one. <laughs> like you just, you just gotta do it though. <laughs> if if you could have censored the Fable instead of just killing the token, it's like wow, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Nobody plays censor. You just can't win with it, David. Censor, you cannot win with this card anymore. I absolutely can win with censor. <laughs> Let's get some censors in this deck. Blue mana, discard it. No. <laughs> Draw no. my Archfiend of the Dross. <laughs> Gosh. All right, last Demir deck I'll mention is, if you're curious, like, what is the stock build right now? It's probably the most recent build that did well in a, in a tournament, and that belongs to Magic Online player Oaf McNamara. Took uh, top 16 in a recent Pioneer Showcase Challenge. And the shell looks a lot like D. Jeff's shell. The only difference is that instead of the archaeologist, it has Jace Vryn's Prodigy, four copies. Um, kind of surprising there. And a slightly different spell suite, but broadly the same. Also playing just three alterations and two Meat Hook Massacres. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But four Archfiend, two Chrome Host, Sea Shark, and the usual suite of blue-black interactive spells with four Dig Through Time. So another really cool effect here is playing, again, one negate, almost no counter magic because they want Jace to buy back self. They're playing five one-mana disruptive spells. So that is what I like uh, about this deck. Because the disruptive spells are better anyway. You, it's hard to leave up counter magic the turn you play Archfiend. Like you said, you have to wait till turn five, even if you're playing Stubborn Denial. This lets you go like turn three, Duress plus Jace, right? And then if they don't take the removal... You can even leave a removal spell in their hand. If they don't kill Jace, you just loot, flip it, recast the duress if you need to protect your 6-6. Six, six. Um, so I think that that actually just, like, the curve works very well. And Jace is a card that's a must-kill, so you aren't just turning on removal just to kill your Archfiend. They have to spend it on the Chrome Host and the Jace. Whereas the Archaeologist, which always gives you value, so that's a big plus over Jace and doesn't die to shock, um, or can <laughs> not die to shock, uh, it's not a card they ever have to kill once it's in play, whereas Jace actually is going to uh, force them to spend a removal spell. So it's it's kind of interesting, the two tensions. Those cards both have value either, or, you know, depending on what you're playing against. Hmm. All right, so that's kind of what the Demir control might look like, whether a streamlined 60-card version or more of a Yorian control that occasionally will alteration combo. There's more to explore here, right? Like I mentioned, I asked the people in our Faith is Brewing Discord about like what, what's left to investigate. And Law 11 said he's got like eight more Demir shells he wants to try, as well as other avenues. Like what about, uh, what if we want a Neoform for the Archfiend? Or what if we want to put it in uh, Esper Legends, for example? And it turns out that we had another list submitted for our brew review episode that does exactly that, specifically trying to Neoform into the Archfiend combo. So this is the final Archfiend deck that we'll talk about here today, and it's submitted to us by great friend of the show, Kilgore Trout 593 It's called Drost to Kill. Drost to Kill. Ever there with the on-point puns. Archfiend of the Dross, Metamorphic Alteration, and Neoform. What do you do with those? Well, Kilgore has decided to shoehorn this package into Soul Flare. 
actually soul flareless soul flare to be more specific yeah there's, there's, no, there's not a soul flare here <laughs> something had to get got to make room for this this arch fiend package and it turns out that it is the namesake card soul flare has been cut from the soul flare deck but that's okay we got it we got the new soul flare new soul flare drops called herborg scavengers that's from march of the machine aftermath it's a three drop whenever it attacks or enters the battlefield, you get to exile a creature from a graveyard, put a counter on the Urborg Scavengers, and it will pick up all the activated abilities, all the keyword abilities, rather, of a creature that it exiles. So you can kind of build your own Soul Flayer there by exiling things with haste, exiling things like Zatalpa, like 5-mana Samut, like Nighthawk Scavenger. Why would you consider pairing these? Well, it just turns out that Urborg Scavengers has the right mana cost. That's a three drop. You can use it. You can sacrifice that to go get your Archfiend. And you're playing other cards like the Nighthawk Scavenger, also a three drop. Sacrifice that to get your Archfiend. So that's the way that Kilgore has put this together. You have most of the cards look like they're set up to support the Urborg Scavengers plan. Three Zatalpas, one Stripe Overwinder, four Summit Voice of Descent, three Nighthawk Scavenger. You have some setup, so you have Sylvan Caryatid, three copies, Oracle of Tragedy, three copies, four Grissy Salvage, and four Otherworldly Gaze. Then your four Neoforms, your three Archfiend of the Dross, your three Metamorphic Alterations, 21 lands. Yeah, this is a tough mix and match for me because Scavengers pays you off for having keywords, and Neoform pays you off for having creatures with Enter the, the Battlefield abilities. And they typically don't exist on the same card, although that'll be the next move for Wizards Fire Design. <laughs> so you'd normally want like a, uh, I don't know, a three mana, one, one, you know, that or three, two that makes two energy and draws a card or something like that. That's a good card in Neoform into Archfiend or a three mana card that ramps when it comes into play, puts a basic land into play. There's a handful of cards that do that. Um, but those cards aren't good with Herborg Scavengers. So... I'd be curious to see which half of this deck is very good, right? Like, it feels like these don't work very well together. You're, you're, it's pulling you to play a, a different suite of cards. Sylvan Carry Added being a ramp spell that also has Hexproof is interesting for Scavengers. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, kind of a, it's, it's kind of a tough way to combine the two ideas. Yeah, it's hard to imagine me wanting to sacrifice my Urborg Scavengers even if I think I can combo with the Archfiend. On the other hand, I really do like how Metamorphic Alteration can become a, a pseudo-terminate if you, if you have a Sylvan Carry to just hanging out. If you have an Oracle of Tragedy just hanging out. <laughs> you can use these to downgrade your opponent's creatures. Maybe, maybe that's... I mean, pseudo-terminate is doing a lot of work when we're giving them a tap, make mana of any color. <laughs> Hexproof blocker. <laughs> well, that's not going to help them because we're going to combo kill them pretty soon. Right. Yeah, I guess I have not played a lot with Herborg Scavengers. You know, we proposed a list where it was sort of the um, five through eight, <laughs> right, of the mm -hmm. uh, of the Delve card. This this list seems like it's a little muddled to me. I'd be I'd be interested more in just like going all in on Neoforming into the Archfiend. Um, for instance, you kind of described it. You can play the two and a white card that finds the metamorphic alteration. And then the next turn, you can neoform that into the Archfiend. Let's say we're playing our fourth land. We can do it all the next turn because um, we'll have four mana. Like that's a curve I'm interested in. The Pilgrim oh, is three. Oh, here Pilgrim. Interesting. Yeah. Neoform Pilgrim on four. We have two mana left. Assuming, let's assume our colors are perfect for this sure. example. Of course. Then, then we metamorphic alteration because we just fetched it, right? So that's interesting to me that that is doing something unique and powerful. Okay, so four color Heliod's Pilgrim Neoform, Archfiend Alteration. A straw it up. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. I, I was thinking like Pyre of Heroes, but then when I went looking for Phyrexians, there's just there's nothing, right? There's no there's no good ETB Phyrexians. The best I could find was like Melkator or maybe the Phyre Phyrexian Flesh Gorger. Like those would be my three drop Phyrexians that I would pyre into the Archfiend. The pyre is kind of slow. It just, yeah, it, it didn't look good. So Neo, Neo form is just like fast, right? As silly as it is, as fragile as it can be, it's so fast. Yeah, and then that's why I like the idea of like the pilgrim is a three mana body that always finds your other combo piece. So you can get away with maybe even playing only three alteration, which this deck is doing. Would it make sense to play three alteration if you're also playing four three mana tutors for it? 
You can play one alteration and like one chain to the rocks because we're in every color already. <laughs> I'm wondering if you even have to play black in this Imagine Shell. Like, can we just play band colors? <laughs> <laughs> band, Helia, Billy Graham. <laughs> All right, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. All right, well, I think that's a perfect place to end our exploration of the Archfiend of the Dross. What do you think, David? Yeah, I think this card is super cool. I'm kind of glad the combo isn't super overpowered. It, you know, it's cool that it's going to be with us for a while because I actually think it has interesting weaknesses, right, in a way that, like, Splinter Twin doesn't. And so I think the gameplay is actually pretty good. You, you can play around it very easily if you don't want to play creatures. You can stop this uh, combo with removal. Um, the deck has to play, like, a very uh, ambigu you know, unambiguously weak card in Metamorphic Alteration in some number. So this is the kind of combo deck that I love the existence of. Uh, I think the gameplay between it is cool. The fact that you can build like multiple different Demir lists, we're not even adding another color and, and they play out different ways. Like this is so different than other combos, which are kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And, and this one, I think, lends itself to great gameplay, great, great deck design. Were the successor to Demir Inverter or no? Well, not in power level, I don't think, but I think it's way better for the game, which is why I, mm. I don't see a reason this would ever get banned. The problem with Inverter is no normal cards interacted with it. It was literally just interfering with their hand or interfering with it on the stack. Um, but creature removal affects this. I mean, that's the whole thing that stops all the other stuff, right? Like just being able to play a random <laughs> interactive spell that you're already wanting to play, like a card that's good against mono white is good against this combo deck. That That's a very good sign. Yeah, and if Archfiend ever gets too good, everyone can just load up on Heartless Axe and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the force will be imbalanced. I mean, if you're playing red-black, you should just be playing a couple of Heartless Axe anyway. Oh, really? Like, we haven't even talked about, you could play Heartless Act in your own deck with Thing in the Ice, right? Which mm -hmm. is a deck we've experimented with, a bunch in Pioneer I've experimented with, at least. Mm -hmm. Um... You could do that plus donate. Uh, you could play a Grixis mm -hmm. list. I mean, there's, there's just like a million, you know, we're just talking about a couple colors. Um, you know, we're talking about playing Bant, Heliod Pilgrim. Uh, Law 11's got five more, six more, seven more Demir <laughs> list to play. So I, I just I just think this is like a really rewarding kind of combination of cards that, like we said, hasn't like taken over the format. It's just like another cool cog in, in the sort of multi-spoked wheel that is Pioneer. Yeah. Well said. All right, so that is our initial exploration of Archfiend of the Draw. So we have one more order of business before we sign off. We don't just like to brew these decks. It's important to put them through the fire, get in there, and test them out. So we've got a little testing to report on from last week's show featuring Invasion of Gobacom. David played a league. I played a league. We got good news and we got bad news. <laughs> but should we start with the good news, David? Let's start with the good news. Yeah, so I have famously been super excited. Dan just mentioned randomly in passing the day that Luminarch Aspirant got spoiled. Um, that it works really well with Shatter Skull Charger. And then he had also mentioned just randomly in passing when Kumano Face of Kazakh Kazakhan? Kazakhan? Kakazan? Uh, was spoiled. That's another way on curve, if you play a turn two, that you can play Shatter Skull Charger. So I was waiting for one more card that would allow me to play my red, white, like Shatter Skull Charger. And I've been proposing all kinds of crazy lists to Dan over the years. The one and a white bring back a creature artifact with three mana or less. Like, is there a way to put the charger in the graveyard so we can bring it back? Et cetera, et cetera. Invasion of Gobicon was the perfect card. This card the way that the you can stack the triggers means that if you play it on two get rid of their removal spell play your charger on three attack the invasion the invasion trigger at the end of turn goes on the stack and the shatter skull charger is a conditional <laughs> if win so you just let the plus one plus one counter resolve first shatter skull charger saves in play so you get a three mana four three trample haste with no drawback that immediately starts accruing value from your invasion. So I was super excited to try out this list. Um, I think I proposed a shell. I made a few tweaks, but basically it's Phoenix Chick, Play With Fire, uh, Kumano Face of Kazakhan. And then our two drops are Luminarch Aspirant, uh, Thalia. Baird is really good specifically with just the uh, 
the um, faces, faces Kazakhan. And then the three drops were four Shatter Skull Charger. I wasn't really sure what else I wanted to play. Uh, so I played like two Aldair and Thrill Seeker, three Brutal Cathar. Maybe it should have been three Thrill Seeker, two Brutal Cathar, but whatever. And then the four Invasion. So like a four main deck Invasion, which is a card that I think we famously posted. <laughs> a tweet from someone saying it's not a main deck card. Um, I've been, yeah, I've been waiting for like two years to play this. 5-0 First League. Could not have gone better. Just freaking smoke people and they're like Ooh. man i've never seen this combo before like it's turn three and the shadow skull chargers five four trample and it's gonna get bigger every turn this is the new combo it's boros inverter right this yeah. is the, the, this the new is combo 47 percent win rate <laughs> invasion into shadow skull charger yeah the, the tweet that you referenced was andrew ellenbogen he said invasion of gobekan is not playable in any known pioneer deck oh known see pioneer yes deck. Okay, but this is this is a whole new thing, right? You didn't even know about this one, did you? <laughs> so yeah, possibly we just play good matchups. Uh, I played some close matches against Mono Green, won both of those 2-1, including win, winning both game threes on the draw. Or, yeah, I can't remember. Um, winning multiple games on the draw against him anyway. Uh, beat Salt Irona, and then beat uh, Blue Red Phoenix twice. So it was a 10-0, or 5-0, 10-2. So pretty easy league, actually. Just kind of cruised through. It went really fast. Uh, I won multiple games on most of five. Wow. Uh, you just like <laughs> turn two, take their removal spell, turn three, smash the thing. Especially against red removal, this deck is, I think, more powerful than against cards like Fatal Push. Um, Thalia was great in all these matchups. I brought in my fourth Thalia, I think, in every match. Um, Baird, I uh, took out a lot. It just doesn't do that much, especially against like Blue Red Phoenix. I don't think I'll ever really get to trigger. I think I left one in against Mono Green. It was fine there. Uh, I played two recruitment officers just to keep the, the curve down. The card was terrible. Uh, every game I drew it, I was basically like going to lose because it wasn't literally anything else. I guess I have a screenshot here where I'm going to win, but it could have been literally anything else. Um, Thrill Seeker was really good. It's just like you can only play so many three drops in your aggro list. But yeah, you're just like this disruptive aggro deck. You're like Thalia, whatever, and then the 1-1 one, one that is just pumping out tokens, uh, the plus one, plus one, like just outsizes green if you just can delay them a little bit. And against decks that don't interact, Aspirant into the Charger is just so good. Like first turn, shock their elf, turn two, play that, goes to a 2-2, two, two. turn three, play the other thing, you attack for seven. Um like just kill their Kiora or whatever. So yeah, that, the deck just felt real smooth. I think when you initially drew it up, you had Thundering Raiju and you changed that to Voldaren Thrill Seeker. What did you actually do with the Thrill Seeker? Did you, did you usually sacrifice something or did you just play it and put the counters on something? Um, I have a screenshot here where you can see that actually just going to result in me winning the game the next turn, like out of nowhere. They're at 19 and they're actually dead if they attack with their Phoenix next turn. Oh, well. Um, so yeah, it actually, uh, basically every time I played it, I won that turn. So that's why I think I maybe won in three. It, it mm -hmm. was like, it was often throwing like a seven or eight power creature at them or, you know, winning when they were at seven and they had put up a five, six blocker or something. So both it and the, um, uh, Cathar are there just to kind of like green plays its big five, six guy or like black plays, uh, shielded and, the Cathar or Voldar and Thrill Seeker are like kind of your way through. So Brutal Cathar is obviously much better against Shieldred, and I think Voldar and Thrill Seeker is probably better against like the green creatures. Like it just allows Shatter Skull to outsize them. Mm -hmm. But they still have to block because you're threatening to sack it at the end. And it's also just incredible with Phoenix Chick. Phoenix Chick is just so good with the invasion. It, it makes sure you can flip it all the time. So like you can go Chick. Turn to invasion, disrupt them in some way, attack it with the chick. Okay. And then on the next turn, even if you don't have your Shatter Skull, you could just like Luminarch Aspirant, pump the chick, you know, play another chick, whatever, whatever it's magical Christmas land, like flip the invasion, do one to them, and then both your chicks start absorbing plus one, plus one counters every turn. Yeah, chick seems uniquely amazing in this deck, right? It's evasive, it's got haste. You mentioned you want to replace the recruitment officers. So is there a comparable card like a Phoenix Chick 5 and 6 that we can put in instead? Yeah, you were floating a bunch of like one. I wanted one drop with uh, an, an evasion and haste if possible. 
I was thinking of Gingerbread Man. You pointed mm. out the uh, the white blue hybrid bird. Uh, Judge is familiar. Judge is familiar. I think that might be the card. But it, the thing is, like, I ended up mul- I ended up taking out the one drops every, every cyborg game. So I was down to just the eight one drops, and I'd sometimes take out a chick. So I wonder if maybe you just don't need that many one drops. You should just play more twos. Like maybe just put the Thali in the main deck and. Or because like I don't know if I would have had the discipline to take out the two judges familiars. Those would have seemed okay, or maybe they would have seemed bad against Green, and but I would have maybe kept it in against Phoenix. So the most important thing is that the creature has evasion. So like Bomac Courier is not not a consideration here. Yeah, because once once you have this thing flipped, you really want to attack every turn because then you have this effect. Like I don't know what is a plus one plus one to your whole team every turn worth. It's like a lot of mana and they don't start out none of these creatures do because you're playing red white big enough to attack so um you need a way to keep getting them in which both threatens your opponent's life total threatens planeswalkers because we don't have a cheap way to deal with them and they just keep absorbing counters every turn because it happened i think in my first game against mono green i was kind of in a good spot i had flipped my thing but i couldn't attack anymore they had a, the five six up they had the four four mm-hmm. and I, like I'd have to suicide my board to like do two to them, and there'd only be one creature left to get the counter. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, well, still room to explore here, still iterations to be made, but what a debut. You know, you waited two years, worth the wait, it sounds like. I think other than the Shattered Skull Charger, you can muck around with a three drop as much as you want. You could play the full four Thrill Seeker, no Brutal Cathar. You can play the four Thalia. You should definitely cut at least the second bear. The first bear is probably pretty good. Like Kazakhan into bear is just just a reasonable like fine mid range play. And then the recruitment officer just should just be something else. Like I don't know if it should be a two drop. I don't know if it should be a like another spike field hazard. Uh, I I don't know. Hmm. Is that maybe Karizev two drop is that? Yeah, Karizev's. Yep, hmm. I could get into that. Interesting. Well. We'll see. I mean, this list will be published by the time the episode is out. Uh, it's also on our Twitter feed. That's at FaithlessMTG. So hopefully some other people can give it a spin and give us some feedback on how it goes for you. Yeah, the other thing I want to highlight is Den of the Bugbear. That card was really key to just, like, finish off games. Oh, like Den by itself or Den with the Light Shield Array? Basically by itself. Like, you, you get them close, right? We don't have that mm-hmm. much direct damage like a red deck would. So, like, you just... We, there are multiple times when it's like any haste creature or an untapped land is the game. Because you get to untap Dan, attack with it, and a 1 1, and you've got, you know, a Baird and a counter, and a Kazakhan, and a two power Phoenix or something. Like, you just, all this little damage adds up, and you just need like one more attacker, and Den gives you two bodies. Nice. All right, don't cut the Dens. <laughs> Do not cut the Dens. Maybe go up to a fourth. Yeah. All right, so that is a successful 5-0 with Shatter yes. Skull Invasion. <laughs> it seems like the perfect place to end the episode, but I, I do have to mention I did play one league myself. Yeah, we, we got to get this one in. Uh, this was not successful. So it's a black-white processors list. This is, I think, one of the, your more speculative concepts, David. I don't know if we did it justice when we were deck teching it last week, but I think the idea is the Evasion of Gobukhan much like Elite Spellbinder, temporarily exiles their card, it taxes it for a couple extra mana. What if, while it's exiled, I can use that with Wasteland Strangler, right? Wasteland Strangler will process the card at the graveyard, I'll kill a creature, I'll have an amazing play. And then once you start looking for pieces that surround that, you identify its Soul Partition as this kind of pseudo-removal spell It can take out any of the opponent's permanents and make it cost more, but it can also blink your own permanent without attacks. That could mean recasting your Wasteland Strangler. Or if you want to get really crazy, it could mean blinking your own Demonic Pact. So I'm not quite sure what led you down the Demonic Pact route, although it was the best card in the deck. Um, so I guess that was correct. <laughs> Four Demonic Pacts, which you get rid of either by blinking it with a Soul Partition, blinking it with a main deck Yorian, or you can kill it with your own Vanishing Verse if it's a real emergency. And we have one Rite of Oblivion as a sacrifice outlet as well. Plays out like a control deck, like a mid-range control deck, because it's a lot of interaction in black-white. Not that many creatures. Um, you have the Stranglers, you have a couple of Graveyard Trespasser. 
We have the option to juke into elite spellbinders in the sideboard if the matchup calls for it. Um, but mainly our, our strength here is our, our massive removal suite and these kind of cute plays you can do syncing up the processor synergy. Is that fair to say, David? Yeah, I, this started with just the soul partition and the temporary lockdown as the XL uh, things because at the time the red-white deck was everywhere and temporary lockdown is, I think, the best deck against Convoke. Um, I guess maybe Anchor is equally good, but temporary lockdown is just really good against them. It gets rid of all their tokens. It gets rid of all the artifact tokens that you know the three inspectors make, etc. So I was trying to build a deck where we didn't have any two mana permanents that lockdown would hit of our own. Um, and then the soul partition as a way to blink the lockdown for like to give you an extra wrath in the future. Because uh, you don't really give them value. They just generate more artifacts that would die to the lockdown was the thought. And then I just kind of put the Gobicon in there as like an, another exile effect. Um, mm. But you're, it's funny, your description of the league and my experience playing my aggressive league is like, Gobicon actually sucks if you don't uh, put any pressure on them. Exactly. Uh, whereas Soul Partition is actually pretty good because you can target your own stuff, etc. So, but I was just thinking like, oh man, it would suck if I didn't actually like kill my opponent. They're just going to cast this spell like on turn six instead of turn four. <laughs> Right, so I did win a match against Enigmatic Fires. I had just enough disruption to keep them from going off, and just enough card advantage, thanks to Blinking Demonic Pact over and over again, to grind it out. But beyond that, I mean, I just couldn't do it. Like, I lost all the other matches, both to aggro decks, where they were just too fast, and to decks that had a better long game. Um, Mono Green is at Phoenix. Invasion just, yeah, you can't play it without pressure. And no, this deck, no. I just couldn't assemble the pressure. So it was like very depressing because I have so much early disruption. Some of it's like temporary disruption. So I am I know that I'm off to a fine start and then you just watch it slowly slip away. Like yeah. Turns go by and most of your cards are reactive. So you can't actually pull ahead until you draw a Demonic Pact. And then you're just like waiting for them to draw out of it. And eventually they they hit their land drops. They start playing at the top of the deck. You can't thought seize that. And before you know it, it's like, all your early stuff is erased and it's just hopeless from there. So this isn't the right approach for at least for invasion. Uh, maybe there's a way to, okay, cut the invasions and go harder on. And the pact was quite good here. Pact was very good. Maybe we just go harder on that. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the soul partition demonic pact wasteland strangler package with temporary lockdown, that is something with the black disruption, the shell I gave you guys, I, I am not surprised didn't go very well. <laughs> <laughs> it was sad it was real sad um, yeah even even the um the pact itself or excuse me the invasion actually does get hit by temporary lockdown so like i just i did uh, the whole point of the deck was to not have anything of ours that got hit by lockdown but i found something that did i mean what was crazy was i was getting ground out by red decks because they they just have like natural card advantage built in like throughout their deck with bone crusher giants and they bring in like showdown of the skulls and they were playing Ren's Resolve and Reckless Impulse and stuff. I loved your screenshot with the Dranith Magistrates. It makes me wonder if we should just like 4X them, like main deck. Right, right. You had a couple Dranith in the sideboard, which I did steal a game from the PNLR deck with a Dranith to shut down every card they drew. Yeah, that's an awesome screenshot. Well, the thought there was like, again, against some of these like other decks, they're going to take out their removal because we don't have that many creatures. Then we'd bring in our Dranith, right? And we just like juke them game two. But yeah, the, the Gobacons, it's... It, I think this is what Andrew w was talking about in his tweet. Like you really need to be all, all in in an aggro deck. Like this is buying you time. Mm. And unless you have a very efficient way to kill it, which is why the Phoenix, et cetera, is so good where you're immediate. You're okay. So, so you're saying, okay, we have to be very aggressive, but normally if you're aggressive, you don't want to waste three life, right? You're, you're basically lightning helixing your opponent to not uh, to kill this instead. So you need a way to like have a bunch of creatures that immediately absorb the plus one plus one counter so you get that damage back right away and you get the benefit of the disruption and the other side. Like you need you need to turn all that into something to turn it into like a good turn two play. Yeah. That's a good summary. So mid-range control, that ain't it. No. Boros aggro. Yes. Let's yes. let's keep going there. Let's have more yes. of that. He's doing well. Let's hear more from him. <laughs> All right, David, I think that's a good place to leave it here. Some lessons learned and some new directions to explore. Uh, we'll see what Archfiend does for us and we'll report back to you next week. Sounds like a plan. Take care. 
deck lists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for all of our testing results. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you.